Hello? <laughs> Can Spider-Man come out to play? Where is she? Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my channel. I'm Frank and it's finally here. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a Green Goblin helmet. I don't like that, but I kind of like that. So, I got done with this helmet quite a while ago, roughly around the release of No Way Home, and it's been a little bit, so I apologize that it's taken so long. But in this video, I'm going to take you guys through the steps I followed in order to make the helmet. That's going to include reviewing the 3D files, how I assembled and kind of welded everything together, the paint, and I know that's what you guys have been waiting for. How did I get that color shift finish with spray paint cans? And then finally, the thing I was most worried about, the lenses. How am I gonna get those really cool, creepy yellow eyes? Those eyes, those horrible yellow eyes. I actually had to learn a few new tricks for this build, uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to the lenses, and I'm really excited to show you guys that. So strap in, I'm gonna take you through the whole process, and first up, the files. First is a pretty good free file from DO3D or Do3D depending on your flavor. And while it is free, it's probably not as good as their paid one. We are gonna download this one and take a look at it. It just doesn't have the same cuts as the paid file. And it does look a little bit different, though arguably maybe possibly better. This is the paid file by DO3D. This is the Goblin Helmet V2. And it's cut up a, a lot better than the other version. The teeth are removable, the ears and everything come out. It's just kind of a better model. Obviously it's a V1 and a V2. You do also have the option of the VEC 3D file. I don't know how much this one is and I don't know how it's cut up, but uh, VEC is pretty good, so I don't think you'd be sad getting this one either. However, if you want to get the V2 like I did and you happen to drop it into your cart for $29, oh hey look, you can use promo code FBT20 to save 20% off and now it's $23. And that's honestly uh, not too bad for a pretty good file. This is, uh, this is, upper level DO3D stuff. I had no problems with the file and we'll take a look at it here in a second. Okay, so here are both Goblin helmets dropped into Mesh Mixer. Now I've gone and rebuilt them using the parts that are provided. So first, this highlighted one is the free model and as you can see that the entire dome, the ears, the mouth, even the teeth are all one part and you cannot separate these um, by using edit, separate shells, it just doesn't work in this case. So you are stuck with that or you're gonna have to make your own sloppy plane cuts now you can take as much time as you want with this you can drop it in a blender if you know how to do that stuff the lenses are separate pieces and then there's this mouth cover that I didn't use anyway and then you have the entire back piece and if you compare it to the V2 I actually think it looks a little more menacing uh, the mouth is open a little bit more it looks like you have more headroom back here compared to the paid file but you can already tell with the paid file the ears are separate, the whole mouth part is separate, the teeth are separate, it has this cool dome part, and everything locks together a lot better. And you'll see later in the video when I go to weld everything, how everything kind of overlaps, and it lets you print this on a much smaller printer, or at least not have to make all these crazy sloppy cuts. So for the sake of this video, we're gonna use the file I used, and we're gonna drop these files into Cura. Uh, maybe I will drop this entire faceplate into Cura as well, and we'll just see uh, how big of a printer you need to one shot the free file. Now, before we go moving this into Cura, let's talk about scale real quick. If you're fortunate enough to have printed other DO3D files, uh, they're usually consistently about the same size. I typically don't need to scale down or up DO3D helmets. For example, their Red Hood uh, Rebirth helmet fits me perfectly at 100% scale. So when I printed this Goblin helmet at 100% scale after doing some checks, it fit me just fine. And for anybody wondering, the circumference of my head is about almost 24 inches around. Yes, this is a 3D print of my head. If you wanna learn more about scaling, I'll link a video down below on how I got this, other ways to scale helmets to make sure you're doing it right. You can go watch that and come back to this part of the video to continue once you know that this thing's gonna fit you. So uh, yeah, go check that out. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm gonna go ahead and drop in the full helmet of the free file, and we're gonna center this on something like an Ender 3. Obviously, that is way too big to fit on an Ender 3, but how big of a printer would we really need? I kind of think an Ender 5 Plus is still gonna be just a little bit too small for this to one-shot this helmet. Um, yeah, there's just gonna be no way. Uh, it's actually, that's actually surprisingly close. If I scaled that down a little bit, I might be able to fit that 
but man, those supports are gonna be crazy. We might unfortunately be looking at something more akin to like a CR10 Max or a S4, or S5. Um, this might even fit a CR6 Max, I believe. They're 400 cubed. But this is just gonna be such a crazy one shot. And I think for about that 20 bucks to get the pre cut file, you might as well just go do that. These two parts here are the biggest parts on the paid file. And uh, I did print these on an Ender 5 Plus. I do know for a fact that these do fit. You just need to turn them uh, just a little bit at a 45 and then we can go ahead and center that. And then as long as you play with these angles a little bit, these are actually pretty simple to print. If you guys wanna take a quick look at the settings I was using for this on my Ender 5 Plus, this does have a 0.6 millimeter nozzle and you can print pretty quickly with these things. So we're gonna go ahead and raise that to a 65. Always, always, always drop your support density to two or 3%. It saves you so much material. I print in with a raft because it makes my prints come out more consistently every time. But if you have something like an Ender 5 Plus, um, I think if I really played around with this, you might be able to fit it on something like a CR-10S Pro V2. It looks like it's close. This is 300 by 300 by a 350, a standard CR-10 size. Uh, they're a dime a dozen nowadays. They're definitely easy to find. But I definitely think you could play around with fitting it on here. And again, just playing, yeah, say, look at that. You can play around with it and use more supports, less supports, or maybe you just have a big printer because they're cheap now. Okay, two days for this is a little excessive, over half a roll, almost a full roll of filament. Now, this is using a buttload of support. You can play around with support blockers. You can block a lot of this out. You'll know your printer, hopefully, by the time you're printing this. Um, maybe stand it up a little bit more. You could even print it upside down if you really wanted to. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this is probably gonna be the biggest part you one shot during this helmet. So again, play around with settings. Now let's talk about the smaller parts, the uh, face part and then the ears. Like I said, these fit on an Ender 3 size printer and this is how I positioned the face plate itself. I tipped it back a little bit more and again, you can play with this however you want. And I will tell you, I did let this take nearly three days to print. This is, uh, it's not a highly detailed face, but it does have a lot of nooks and crannies. And I did not want to sit there sanding this thing. So I did up the quality. I did let the printer run a little bit longer. And it really doesn't use that many supports. Again, I just don't want the support interface to be on the front of it. I let the back eat up as much as possible. And that's how I printed them. The ears followed a pretty similar method, uh, just positioning them small enough and you know, standing them up enough that I didn't need to have a lot of support interface or collision anywhere where the supports are. It's going to be a nice flat area. You can add custom supports to this. You can block some of the supports of this. You can flip it upside down. Again, you can print this however you want, but this is roughly how I printed the ears. Now for the little bits that go into this mask. Uh, first off, I didn't print the mouth insert. I just used some fabric cloth for that. Uh, there's no point in really printing that anyway. And the teeth. I resin printed these. Now resin printers have come down a lot in price. You can get Elgu Mars for like uh, less than 200 bucks. If you can figure out how to print these big dome pieces on FDM printers, I'm pretty confident you can print these teeth on a resin printer. They're very small, simple to position, or print them in FDM and just stand them up. But what I wanna talk about now are the eyes. Now this was the biggest point of contention for trying to figure out this helmet. I went through a lot of ideas. There are people talking about printing in clear uh, PETG and then sanding and wet sanding and polishing. I went a different route. I decided to uh, vacuum form the lenses. Now, vacuum forming isn't something everybody's going to have access to. However, just like 3D printing, the cost of at-home vacuum formers has come down significantly. Now, you can build your own, and I've wanted to do that for a long time. However, a company called Vacuum Form, ha, great, sent me this desktop vacuum former called the DT2, and it's awesome. And now, with the power of anime and vacuum forming on my side, I 3D printed some bucks to vacuum form around. And basically, what that is, is you need a mold to melt the plastic and let it settle down on the print or the piece and then it sucks it into the shape and then you're left with the mold. Now there are a lot of people who said you couldn't vacuum form uh, PLA. I'm going to tell you right now that's a lie. You just need to print it really, really dense. This is a nearly uh, maximum support to 90% infill fill buck of the lens. I'll show you how I position this but you can see that this is just like support material holding the lens up, and then when I go and vacuum formed it and popped it out, it, well, I had the lenses, and they worked great. There will be a video coming out soon about vacuum forming as a whole and my little experiments with it. This was not as easy as I thought it was gonna be, especially then trying to tint the lenses afterwards, so there was a lot to play around with here, but it did help me reach my end goal. 
Let me show you back in the program how I position them. Then I want to go into actually assembling the helmet. All right, and this is how I made the buck for the lens. You can see that there's no weird overhang angles. The plastic is basically just wrapping around a pyramid shape the entire time. And this is one solid piece almost all the way through and it worked great. Now, I will say you do have some other options besides vacuum forming. And honestly, you don't really need this crazy shape. If you go and follow my helmet visor tutorial, you really should be able to warp the plastic and bend it just enough to fit into the mask itself without having to worry about having that perfect uniform shape. Is it gonna protrude and be like as accurate as you might want? Maybe not, but you know, spending a thousand dollars on a vacuum former just for some small lenses might not be everybody's cup of tea. So there definitely are other ways to do this and still maintain a very good look, but this is the path I went and I know it's a little bougie, but I will do my best to explain other ways to do the lenses when we get to that part. So you got everything printed and now you've gone to the actual assembly part. Now those little interlocking tabs I was talking about make it very easy to PLA weld and you could even really theoretically glue this together, but I don't know why you wouldn't just, you know, fuse the helmet all together once that's what I went and did just kind of weld on the inside and make sure everything's nice and secure leave the teeth out and we'll talk about the eyes later but now with everything welded together in more or less its final form let's talk about the thing you guys have been asking me about for a while now the paint I'm gonna do my best to take you through all the steps I went through with a couple clips and this way I can show you guys how to get from this to this Sanding sucks. Nobody likes sanding. I get it. No one wants to do it. That's why I talked about upping your print quality a little bit in the beginning. This way you can get around the face area really easily and not have to really worry about too many layer lines. But the quality is really going to depend on you and your skill set and your printer and really how much time you want to pour into this. I will say though, Duplicolor Filler Primer still came in so clutch for this project. I cannot recommend this stuff enough. I am working on a new priming and sanding tutorial that will be out eventually. It's a revamp of the original one. But but for now, check out this video where I talk more about the filler primer. Um, hopefully that helps you guys, but this stuff is great. And if you can't get your hands on that, really any filler primer will do. It just helps cut down on the time you're gonna take having to sand. But as for the big dome parts, you can knock that down with a power sander real easily. Conveniently enough, it's actually a trending topic on Instagram right now. Everybody talking about prep uh, prep work and layer lines. This is your time to get rid of those layer lines. There are some spots on the helmet I even skipped out on because you're never going to see them and uh, I'm really not going to show you, so don't ask. However, due to the finish I was aiming to get on this helmet, I really did take my time in this uh, sanding and priming stage. And if you prime the helmet and it doesn't look good, sand it more, go back, rinse, repeat. Because the next step, the gloss black base coat... <laughs> Hey guys, quick little pause. Um, so I'm realizing while I'm editing this video right now that I'm actually dumb. I'm so used to using gloss black base coats on all of my prints and my metal casts and all of this other stuff and golds that I'm kind of realizing and looking at the footage that I didn't use gloss black, I used matte black. Ooh. Every time I say the word gloss black, that's gonna pop up letting you guys know that that's not what I meant. So I apologize. Um, I'm glad I caught it though, cause uh, that could have been bad. So let's get back to the video. That, that is where it's gonna show all your flaws. For that, I was just using some really generic Krylon gloss black. Uh, then Rust-Oleum Rust makes some good stuff. Duplicolor makes some good stuff. Really, it just needs to be a good gloss black spray paint. So now let's talk about the green. Now, this was a big choice I had to make. If you look at the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man Green Goblin helmet, that's a real practical suit. And it's more of a matte green while it does have that nice color shift purple green tint. And that's really what I wanted. However, I wasn't a big fan of the matte look. But now if you look at the Spider-Man No Way Home Green Goblin, it's all CGI and it's really just, you know, bright emerald green. Now I did see somebody use just a generic metal cast green on their Green Goblin helmet and it looked great, but I really wanted that color shift pattern. I was able to find this Galactic Custom Wrap color shift and hopefully you guys can kind of see it in the camera. The edges right here is green, but straight on it's purple. And I, was, I really had high hopes for this. And I think if I had gone for a matte finish, this would have looked great and probably gotten me there. But I decided to do a little bit of both worlds. I wanted a nice gloss finish on this helmet to mimic the new, you know, No Way Home kind of goblin. But then I also really wanted that color shift. And that's when I found Tester's Color Shift. These are the paints I used on my Goblin helmet, and my lord, they are great. Now, these cans are very small and kind of expensive, but they're not meant to do a lot of coverage. Like, you're not supposed to douse the prints and, you know, the parts in this stuff. It's more of a tint coat, not too dissimilar than metal cast. This says to use it over a gloss black base coat, so that's exactly what I did, and it was really crazy to see this stuff take effect as you're spraying it. 
It's a little tricky to see in this video, but I start off with that gloss black base coat and I do a couple dust coats of this. And as I start to build it up and get that first wet coat, you can see everything just starts to turn green emerald. It's actually one of the craziest paints I've ever used. There was literally no step in between the gloss black and this, and these are the results I was getting. Now in the end, this was honestly just a little bit too green uh, for my liking. I wanted to pull it back down and I actually ended up going over it with this green copper and it oddly worked very well. It, it, it was just something about the way everything looked. I did very light dust coats of this green copper over the turquoise and it actually helped pull the purple out a little bit more. Maybe there's some science to it. Don't really know why it worked out that way, but that's how I got that nice color shift. And honestly, I think the results speak for themselves. You can kind of see at the top of the helmet here, it does have that nice purple fade and it's definitely a green goblin helmet that I'm pretty proud of. From there, it was just a matter of going over it until it was to my liking and then dousing it with some clear coat. And like literally all the rest of my prints at this point, Duplicolor 1K clear coat. I. It's, it's great stuff and it covers like everything. I will link literally everything I just talked about down below in an Amazon shopping cart. You don't need to buy it from Amazon, but this way you know what to look for and you can go pick it up at an AutoZone or Hobby Lobby or wherever you wanna go. Okay, so if you've made it this far in the video, it's either because you also like making stuff or for some odd reason, you just like listening to me talk. Either way, awesome. Though 3D printer technology has gotten a lot smaller and compact, not everybody has the room for these things or just having the time in general to learn how to 3D print, which I totally understand. But today's sponsor, Zometry, offers an awesome service to combat that. Say you have this really awesome design, you need 3D printed or manufactured, you can upload the file to Zometry and have it printed and sent right to your door. It doesn't just stop at 3D printing. They have injection molding, urethane casting, die casting, CNC machining, and so many more options. One of the main purposes of Zometry is to help you get your hands on little prototypes for your manufacturing process without having to order thousands of units just to make sure that one of them looks good. Whether you're looking into some big engineering project or maybe even some small personal project, you can start your manufacturing journey with Zometry. You can hop online and get a free quote instantly within seconds. So if you guys are interested in the service, go to Zometry.com slash Frank or check the link down below. Thank you again, Zometry, for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the build. Man. Now, as I was saying before, uh, I didn't print the mouth cover. This is actually just a piece of fabric, the neck gaiters that everybody has now because you know the pandemic kind of happened. I just cut it out and hot glued it in there. This way when I'm wearing it, you guys, I'm pretty sure can hear me exactly the same. There's nothing covering this. It just, it lets me talk normal and breathe normal too, which is great. And the teeth were just resin printed, sprayed with some uh, silver spray paint and thrown in there. I thought about making them like a creepy gross yellow, but I do like the silver teeth. It's a little more accurate. So as for the inside of the helmet and getting this thing to fit, I did play around with some foam. This way it sits comfortably on my face. There is a little bit of foam at the top with a little bit of an arch around it. So it wraps kind of around the top of my head and just sits there like a hanger. And even if I don't have the back of the mask on, you guys still kind of can't tell and it looks pretty good in camera. As for the back of the helmet and actually attaching it, it's actually pretty simple. You can over-engineer this as much as you want. I think I did this pretty uh, pretty simple way. I just have some simple purse clasp magnets that I've used in other videos. And at the very top up here, just a little bit of Velcro. Um, putting the helmet on is a little tricky. I don't usually put the back part on because it cuts into my ears right here. And that's why I have some felt. So getting it all on, not the easiest. All right, there we go. Because of where this back part sits up, it does push on my ears and it actually does impair my hearing quite a bit, more than any other helmet I've ever worn. But these are some thicker plastic pieces and there's not much uh, room to really breathe in here. If I had a solid cover on this, I probably wouldn't be able to breathe at all because this is very tight around my neck and like the back of my head. Yeah, it's a, it's a tight helmet, but it does fit. Maybe I would have scaled it up a little bit more, but I think then the proportions would have just looked a little bit off, but overall, I'm pretty happy with it. Now, with the helmet painted, you like how it looks, everything came out great, you can wear it. Let's finally talk about the eyes and finish this up. But if I'm being honest, I, uh, I kind of cheated. I went through a lot of vacuum form poles and a lot of testing to try to figure out the best way to get that nice reflective mirror. After vacuum forming them, I tried tinting them. I like really tried tinting them. I tried a multitude of different methods for vinyls and window tints and taillight tints and stretchy vinyls and trying to get it over it. And it just, it just didn't look right. Even when I got the vinyl stretched over it, you could still see through it and it just didn't have, I don't know, just didn't have the right look to it. 
Then I tried backing it with some chrome spray paint inside of it, but you really need an airbrush and some higher quality paints than what I was using, and you can't see through these things at all. So I eventually landed on a uh, similar idea that I had to my Nova helmet to give it this nice reflective deep red star that actually has some depth to it. I backed it with chrome tint. Now what I mean by that is I was able to eventually get a nice vinyl pull over the vacuum form lenses and they looked great, but again, they were too see-through. They were the proper yellow, but they just, they didn't look right. So if you notice behind them, I have another piece of plastic sitting almost like a secondary lens. This is just a sheet of clear plastic and some chrome window tint. By layering these on top of each other and positioning them behind the lens with, you know, there's about a half an inch distance between the front of the lens and that back chrome plate, it gives a little bit of a sense of depth. So depending on how you're looking at the lens, you're getting these really nice reflections off of it that hide my eyes behind them because now there's two layers of tint, but then reflect all of the light outwards. And I love how it came out. Now, like I said earlier in the video, you don't need to do a vacuum form pull. These are some unique shapes, but you definitely could just bend some plastic in there, glue it in there and call it a day. And really no one would be the wiser. You'd be fine without having them perfectly fit into the helmet itself. So don't beat yourself up if you can't get it to work perfectly. I'm sure if you follow even some of these ideas that I've had, you'll get it to come out just fine. At one point, I also tried using a, a, a lens dye. It dyes PETG plastic and vacuum form plastic. I just, I couldn't get it to work properly. It, it involves using a powder and a dye and boiling water and putting the lens in there and all of this. Um, I just didn't want to mess around with it. I had the vacuum former already and I had the tint already. So I, I just rolled with this. Or hey, maybe if you figure out another method, leave some comments down below on ways you would get the lenses to work. But the uh, the stretchy vinyl tint and the vacuum form pole and doing a little bit of trickery with uh, some chrome tint, yeah, uh, I'm happy. <laughs> So guys, that's pretty much gonna wrap up this video. I know it was a little bit of a long one. Um, there was just a lot of different techniques and methods I used in this video. I've never done a color shift paint, and honestly, I don't have anywhere near as much footage as I should that involves the testing I had to go through to get this. I learned how to do vacuum forming and actually had something successfully work with my vacuum forming poles, and I'm uh, really proud of it, actually. Everything else involved in this helmet is stuff I've showed in other videos, so I didn't really wanna go into great details with it. Um, I will link some more videos down below that I think will help you guys in this build, you know, printing, PLA welding, sanding, that type of stuff. And uh, hopefully through this video, I was able to show you something new about the color shift paint, about the vacuum forming, maybe new ways to wear helmets, um, getting it to look right. And uh, let me know in the comments down below, guys, do you like that I went with a glossy color shift or do you like the Raimi helmet more? Or should I gone have just gone with a solid emerald color? Um, but I I'm proud of this little combo between the two. And yeah, I'd like to know your guys' opinions. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. I have a lot of projects in work right now. Not only am I almost done with Starboost, I am making a dedicated tutorial on uh, the Walsh 3D Mark 39 motorized helmet. This thing is one of the best, if not the best free helmet to print uh, in relation to Iron Man. It's already kind of motorized or like everything's in position for you. There's gonna be such a great tutorial about this helmet. It is great for the community and I wanna highlight this. Aside from that, more Mark 85 videos, more 3D printing videos, and I have a lot of other kind of secret projects that I'm really excited to share with you guys. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns that aren't related to the helmet, drop those down below too. I do read all of the comments, even though I might not always respond to all of them, I am reading them, I am seeing what you guys are saying, and I'm taking all that feedback. But that's gonna be a wrap for this video, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching, and you have a good day.